Many of us very well remember the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We'll come in here in just a moment. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. That's judgment day. So we remember that well. You remember those few words Paul said before that in verse 9, what he wrote? So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. Paul's aim was to please God. As he went through every day, he wanted it to show whether we are present in the body or whether we are away. Then he's saying, I want to be able to know for certain that my aim was to please Him. Is that your aim in life? To please God. Every day, you want it to show. And at the end of life, you want to know. That's what you aimed at with every fiber of your being. To please the One who made you, the One who redeemed you in His Son. Now back to that passage that I read at the beginning of our service this morning. Paul is praying, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Zeroing in on that one phrase, that one request Paul was making of God for these people. Is this the request you make for yourself? God, I want to be fully pleasing to you. Now, everybody who is here this morning, I think, has some desire to please God, at least, or you wouldn't be here. But is your aim to be fully, fully pleasing to Him? I find that a compelling thought in this prayer of Paul. And he's saying he's praying to God about some other things so that we can be fully pleasing to Him. I'm praying that you'll be filled with the knowledge of His will. That you'll have all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So there's knowledge to this. God wants us to know some things so we can be fully pleasing to Him. And with that knowledge, he says that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So it's what we know and it's what we do with what we know and we become fully pleasing to him. And as Paul keeps praying this prayer, he he's saying God strengthens people like that. God em- empowers people who have that aim to be fully pleasing to him. Now, back to what was on the screen here at first, there's a good illustration my favorite in the Bible, and so some of you have heard it before, from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29, of people who, who had different aims in life. And for one in this story, I don't see how it could turn out for anybody any better on Judgment Day, but then you have these other three people, beginning with Herod Antipas who had other aims than to be fully pleasing to the Lord. Let's read this story together, and it'll become really clear, I think, as we point out what these people were all about. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it. uh, Pausing there for a moment, Jesus was creating a stir all over Palestine, and now he had chosen twelve apostles, and he had sent them out to multiply his influence. And they're telling everybody to repent. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. And others said, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John, bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. 
For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Verse 21, but an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I'll give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, because, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to his mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Mark has just invited us to Herod's birthday party. And on that day, we see a lot about Herod, Antipas, and the other people gathered there. It's helping to tell the story of his life. Most any day would help to tell the story of your life. Most any day that, that someone could see some video of, see a picture of, and, and get a summary, it, it would tell what you're about in life. Every day you're writing the story of your life. What kind of thought would this be, that on the judgment day, Jesus would read back to you the story that you've written? You're writing it every day. He's reading it every day. What will it be on Judgment Day to hear him read it back to you? This is not the only place that that we learn about this Herod in the New Testament, but it's like those other places, and we find that, that he's just trying to please everyone. Paul said our aim ought to be to please God, that we ought to want to be fully pleasing to him, but Herod's aim was to please everyone. You see, he's a political figure who, who feels the weight of so many opinions, so many people to please, and then one that's really close to him, it looks like he doesn't want to do anything to get in the way of her pleasure. He was afraid of John the Baptist, who kept telling him the truth about his moral life. He was afraid of Herodias, his partner in adultery. John kept telling him, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And that's what he had done. He'd stolen her from his half-brother. He was afraid of unfavorable public opinion, whether it be the Jews over whom he, he ruled as a governor, basically, or whether it be the Romans who allowed him to have that power. He was afraid. So he tried to keep everyone happy. He was wicked. He was weak. He was impulsive. And his way of life left him with a nagging conscience. I don't know how long it had been since John had died, since he had been beheaded. It couldn't have been a long time, but people are wondering, who is this Jesus walking around saying these things and doing these things? Now, we learn elsewhere in Scripture, John chapter 10, verse 41, that John for whatever reason, was not a miracle worker. God didn't give him that power to back up the message. John's life uh, left his message unmistakable, I think. But these miraculous things are being done, and John must be it, Herod thinks. He's got this nagging conscience. John must have risen from the dead. And that's why Mark goes on to tell us this story. Couldn't be anything but John, Herod is thinking. That's the way it gets for a person who's trying to please everyone. You can't please everyone. And in the attempt, you displease God. 
And so Herod finds himself in this predicament. He's made this outlandish promise to this girl, I give you anything you ask for up to half of the kingdom. He never could have guessed what she would come back and ask for. And so the Bible tells us that the king, in verse 26, was exceedingly sorry. But what am I going to do, he thinks, in front of all these people? And so he follows through. All because he's trying to please everyone. When he sees Jesus on Judgment Day, what a sad story he's going to hear because he tried to please everyone. Then you have this woman to whom he's now married, Herodias. She looked out for number one. Now, that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? You've you got to look out for number one. That's proverbial. But what is life like whenever we are the main thing to ourselves? Well, it's like Herodias here. We don't see ourselves the, the way that we see her... Uh, in this picture painted by the Holy Spirit. But it gets that way for us when we're our main concern. She couldn't stand John's continual call to repentance. She didn't want anyone to point a a convicting or condemning finger at at Herod or her for their unlawful measure or or marriage. She had found a way to to get the power and the pleasure that she enjoyed, and she wanted it to stay that way. She was a manipulative person. I wonder what part she played in these two coming together in the first place. You don't think of of women in olden times as the power players, but when I see her in this little story in the Bible, I just wonder about these two coming together in, in the first place. But she's a manipulator, as we see. She manipulated her lover, she manipulated her daughter, and she became bloodthirsty against John because she couldn't manipulate him for her own purposes. He just kept saying, it's not lawful for you two to be together. So she's hurting one person after another, and that's what a self-centered person will do. A self-centered person will hurt anyone and everyone who has the stomach to tolerate him or her. And if Herodias went on with her self-absorbed ways, she'll hear a horror story on Judgment Day. Now, some of you are thinking, I've heard you say all of this before, Danny, and I appreciate your patience because not everybody here has. But here's something that hadn't been a part of of my study and proclamation of of this passage before. It's the the way of life of this girl reflected in this passage. If Herod aimed to please everyone, and if Herodias was only looking out for number one, then this girl, Herodias' daughter, uh, history names her Salome. Salome aimed to satisfy the wrong one. Now, children are supposed to obey their parents, right? But children aren't supposed to have parents who would tell them to go ask for somebody's head on a platter. Pity the children who have parents who lead them into sin. And pity the parents who lead their children into sin. What a tragedy. Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 and 6, Jesus said, Whoever receives one such little child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18, verses 5 and 6. Now, we like to, to rank sins kind of in our minds... I don't know if we always get it right. But I don't hear any other time Jesus saying, it'd be better for somebody to have a great millstone tied around their neck and to be cast into the depth of the sea. Except when he's talking about somebody who would lead a child into sin. Who would turn a child away from the Lord. 
Now, God never planned for people just to have babies. He planned for people to raise children. And more than that, to make disciples of their children. That's the end game. That's the goal as a parent. And that's aiming to please the Lord as a parent. It's compelling to me to see when the New Testament talks relationships that the Lord's put right in the middle of them. While you keep a marker here in Mark chapter 6, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul starts to talk about all kinds of relationships. Really at the end of chapter 5 is where I'd want to read in just a moment beginning. But through chapter 5 and into chapter 6, he's talking about husbands and wives. He's talking about children and parents. He's talking about masters and servants. He just runs the whole gamut. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You see, the child and parent relationship, so important. What's right in the middle of it? In the Lord. Paul puts the Lord right in the middle of the parent and child relationship. And he tells the the fathers, representative fathers and mothers, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, verse 4. Don't exasperate them, he's saying in between. In the context, to me, to exasperate them is to not bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But you, you give them discipline. You give them instruction in the Lord. That's your job as a parent. Now, backing up into chapter 5, verse 22, he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Me submit to him? Yes. Why? Because of everything he is? No. Because of everything the Lord is. And the pattern that he's put in place. The Lord is right in the middle of the relationship. But then in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. Again, the Lord is right in the middle of that relationships. Husbands, you love your wives. Why? Because they're so lovable. They are. But that's not what he says here. Love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So our, our family relationships are so important. And children have an obligation to obey, and and parents have an obligation to raise kids right. Wives, lovingly submit to your husbands. Husbands, love and sacrifice for your wives, but in the middle of it all is the Lord. Lord. Now here's what the Lord himself said about it in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 39. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. When a couple of what Paul says to all of us in Ephesians 5 and 6, with what Jesus says to all of us in Matthew chapter 10, uh, I have to ask myself some questions, hard questions. Whom do I love the most? How can I tell? How would anybody else know? And what does the Lord see? Now, I want to ask parents who still have children at home to, to listen to me really closely right here. 
Do you love your children more than you love the Lord? Do you? Do you love your children more than you love the Lord? Well, how could we tell? There's one way. Around whom does the schedule revolve in your home? Around whom does the schedule revolve? Is, is it around you? Is it around your children? Or is it around the Lord? About whom do we talk the most? Are we trying to sell everyone on, on the beauty of our children or the beauty of Jesus? Do we want everyone to know more about the accomplishments of our kids or more about what the Lord accomplished for the whole world when he died for our sins? If the world revolves around anyone but Jesus, then we've lost our center. And we're doing our kids wrong if they really feel like they're the center of the world. Jesus should be the center of our world. Jesus should be the center of our kids' world. And if he doesn't have that place, we need to give it back to him. Because if he's not the center, if we're not already causing our children to stumble and causing our children to sin, it's going to happen if we follow that track. And it's going to be bad for them. And it'd be better for us if we wore a millstone around our neck and were cast into the depths of the sea. And we turn it around a little bit because in, in this passage it was this daughter, Herodias, who would do whatever her mom wanted her to do. But the application stands there. It's not our job to do whatever our kids want. It's not our job to make them number one. Jesus belongs in that place. If things never change, then this poor girl in this true story is bound to hear a tragic story on Judgment Day. That's the way it's going to be. If you, if you try to please everyone, if you only look out for number one, and I could have stayed there as long as I did on this last point, or if you try to please the wrong one, whoever it is. But then there's the beautiful life of John the Baptist. Here's John just being everything that, that we know him to be. His aim, like Paul was praying back there in Colossians chapter 1, was to fully please the Holy One. Now that's what his life was all about. John wanted more than anything to please God, and he wanted to help everyone else please God. And John was good at that because he talked the talk and he walked the walk. Day in and day out, he told God's truth. He told it to the rich and the poor, to the elite and those who were left behind, to the people who wanted it and to the people who didn't. He was the same man wherever he went. Wherever people saw him, because he had the singular focus of pleasing God. A little bit of uh, insight on something that we ought to pay attention to. And I think I've said up here before, one way that I want to be a whole lot more like John the Baptist is not to just say something that ought to be said once and think, there, I've said it. 4, verse 18, John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Uh, we as Christians, and we talked about this recently, have a hard time getting out of our mouths what we ought to say to fellow Christians and to family and to other people in the way of encouragement sometimes and admonition on the other side. But when we bring ourselves to have the, the courage the Lord wants us to have to say what we ought to say to somebody, we think, well, okay, I said it. John didn't go about it that way. Apparently, the first time he ever had an encounter with Herod, he said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, if we looked at, at Old Testament law, certainly there's Jewish law given by God for, for that, but it, it wasn't against Roman law. 
And Herod was an Edomian, technically speaking, and not a Jew. So he, w- he wasn't a covenant participant in the law of Moses. He wasn't breaking the law of Rome. But God had a law from the beginning about marriage. And here's what God says about what you're doing, Herod. It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And the Bible says he had been saying it to Herod. He kept saying it. In uh, the Greek, that's in the imperfect tense. We think mostly past, present tense whenever we think about verbs. The imperfect. That's talking about something that happened in the past, but it kept on happening. He just kept on. Kept on telling Herod every chance he get, you can't go on this way. Now, Herod, the Bible tells us, uh, heard John gladly, verse 20. I think it's the New American Standard that says he enjoyed hearing him. He, He liked getting together with John. Something about John compelled him. But not everything he heard was enjoyable, surely. Every time he saw John, it seems John was bringing this up. So John wanted other people to please the Lord. He didn't want people to meet the Lord on Judgment Day with some other kind of story than one that's about fully pleasing the Lord. So that's the way he lived, and that's the way he taught. And Jesus would say about him then in Luke chapter 7, verse 28, I tell you, among those born of women... There's not been one greater than John. So, if I'm you, every time I'm reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I come across John the Baptist, I want to pay close attention. When Jesus says that about him, (laughs) there hasn't been one better than this. There's probably not going to be. Jesus himself accepted. Jesus continued in Luke seven twenty eight. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Now, how could that be? It's because John preceded the kingdom. John died before the kingdom was established on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Peter could preach to people, even who had been there, crying out for the crucifixion of Jesus, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, there's forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of the sin of trying to please everyone instead of God. Forgiveness of the sin of only looking out for number one instead of the interests of God. Forgiveness of the sin of trying to please the wrong one instead of God. There's forgiveness for that if you will repent. What joy it will be for John to hear Jesus read his story on Judgment Day. So you've seen these four contrasts in life. Now the first three are, are really related. And we can be infected with a little bit of all of what we see in those three characters. What I'm asking you, as you look into the Bible's mirror this morning in Mark chapter 6, in whom do you see yourself most clearly? Is it in Herod? Do you know, do you know this morning that's the problem? That's... That's why things are the way in my life. I'm trying to please everyone. Or you look at, at, at Herodias, and, and can you be really, really honest with yourself this morning and say, I've not been looking out for anybody but number one. It's had to be about me, my way. And you can see that because of all the broken relationships littering your life. Or maybe one that's really important. Do you see yourself in in this girl? Did she did exactly what her mother told her? But it wasn't the time. It wasn't the place. It wasn't the right thing to do. So your life is on the track where it is because it's not God you've been trying to please. It's some other person who shouldn't be playing that part in your life that only God plays. 
Or can you honestly this morning, and I hope you can, because you've been praying the way Paul prayed, and you've been doing your best to, to know God and to walk worthy of Him, can you look at yourself and see in John the Baptist, that's, that's like me. That's what every day I'm trying to be, fully pleasing to the Lord. Let's remember that just like these three people, on Judgment Day, the story's going to be told. The story of your life. You're going to be happy to hear that? There's no reason you shouldn't be. Not with the way Jesus has made forgiveness available to us and made the knowledge of God wide open to us for everything that that we need in this life to please Him. Are you doing that? I pray that you are. If we need to pray for you this morning in that regard, we would want to do that. If it's time for you to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and start living as a disciple of Christ, it really is the time. Let's do something about it this morning. We're singing a song specifically to encourage you. We invite you to come to the front while we stand and sing together.